Okay. Okay. So, um, I really had no intention of making a video, but this just fell into my lap. So, <laughs> and of course, well, okay. Before I get ahead of myself, um, I was looking for silent films, like a, a silent film uh, to critique for Saturday. And I found one that was intentionally destroyed. I don't come across that a lot. <laughs> and turns out that the story behind it is not something that I can put in the critique. So that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to try really hard not to get too get too heated or anything like that because people that I'm going to have to talk about, we've talked about before and I got heated then. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll try really hard <laughs> to control myself. Okay. So I mean, we've talked about other movies that uh, were uh, intentionally destroyed. Now, there's accidental uh, destruction, such as fire. Um, this isn't, like, intentionally destroyed, like, when the war happened and then uh, the materials were needed. Nothing like that, no. Uh, intentionally destroyed, such as, like, with Nosferatu, the... Um, the the lawsuit said that every single uh copy had to be destroyed one survived <laughs> there is also the fatty arbuckle scandal i actually did a video on that and i will put that in the description box but basically hollywood stated that uh if uh you were friends with roscoe you would get fired. They were also destroying all of his movies. The ones that we have, we're lucky to have. I mean, <laughs> that's just the bottom line. Well, I came across this one. And as I was reading, I thought, oh, so that's why it was destroyed. Then it knocked me for a loop. <laughs> Okay, so it's going to do that to me. <laughs> so the movie is Anne of Green Gables. Okay, now I'm a fan of Anne of Green Gables. I was a kid in the 80s. I remember watching uh, Anne of Green Gables on PBS. I mean, I have a lot of good memories with uh, my cousins. The granddaughters were at Grandma's house, and we watched, well, playing board games and uh yeah we got to stay overnight at grandma <laughs> at grandma's house and uh while at the aunt's house the the grandsons got to do whatever who knows what they were doing <laughs> they were probably playing video games but um but yeah so i have a lot of good memories i have i actually have the box set I actually found it. I thought I was going to be buried deep in book in, uh, boxes. And as you can see, the first book is like bulging out. <laughs> I've had these since I was like nine or ten. I've had this box set since I was like nine, ten years old, and I haven't read all the books. I've made it, I think, to the fourth book. and uh, But I've read that first book so much. It's just completely destroyed. <laughs> see if I can I mean just uh, just completely I think you could see that look at that it's <laughs> oh good heavens I'll put that back in later but <laughs> I read it so many times and uh, it was silent reading through middle school <laughs> 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 
and then I have the VHS set. I found the VHS set at the um at the collection shop here in town, and uh, I had to snatch them up. <laughs> A <laughs> little bit of nostalgia for me. <laughs> May not watch them, but at least I have it on the shelf. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a lot of memories for me with Anne of Green Gables, reading the books, watching the uh, the Megan Fellows version. And um, I've seen other versions as well. There's the 1930s version. And so I thought, you know, why not? Um, look and see if they had a, a silent version. I mean, it, it seem why wouldn't they especially when they had at least two versions that are lost now of little women why not well in 1919 they had anna green gables and I was sad that it was lost, but it was intentionally lost, as I said before. Well, the director is William Desmond Taylor. The actress who plays Anne Shirley is Mary Miles Minter. Okay. Before we get into that, let's talk about the movie itself. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the movie itself. Now, I understand taking liberties. Okay, and I'm sure even back then you took liberties, especially with the censors, right? Okay, the censors were very strict back then. Excuse me, sorry. And <laughs> in fact, uh, one... Good example would be the Sheik. Now, the Sheik has a very, I'm going to say, inappropriate scene. I have to say that for YouTube reasons. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't say the actual word. But, um, but there's the scene where you see uh, in... The Sheik, where Rudolf Valentino and Vilma are, where he's arguing and basically he opens up like this. And he's, I mean, he's basically yelling at her. And then, you know, she's uh, saying stuff to him. And then it basically cuts from that scene. And it, a lot of people are saying that. You know, film historians and fans have said that that scene is a cover up of what was in the actual book, which was the inappropriate scene. And, and, uh, so <laughs> I get it. I get it. Now, um, then you have someone like <laughs> like Theta Barra who just liked to mess with the censor. <laughs> she didn't care. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and uh and there were others. But when you have a, a, a story, you know, a well known story such as uh, because the the sheik was popular, and there were people at the time that went to see this movie, and they were disappointed because it didn't stick to the book. There were censors. <laughs> what are you talking about? And but you also have to cut for time, even back then. And it it amazes me that actually with. Uh, there was that 12 minute a Christmas story and uh, or uh, which one was that the the Charles Dickens yeah Christmas Carol is what it was and basically that's all they needed I mean he's uh, <laughs> he's a miser he sees the three ghosts and then he's he's changed 12 minutes that's all you need <laughs> why are we going two hours on this <laughs> 
they had it right in 1908 <laughs> or whatever it was. <laughs> Look, Gone with the Wind, I, I hated that book. I read that book and I'm, I was I was trying so hard to like it. Then I saw the movie and I'm like, this makes so much sense. And like, it's not so much that I'm more of a visual person. It's just the fact that, okay, here's a spoiled brat, Rhett Butler. He sees right through her crap. He falls in love with her. And can see right through her flaws and everything. But even after all they've been through, she still is immature and won't grow up. So why should he put up with it? I mean, my gosh, the whole thing with their child and she's still thinking about herself. He was devastated. I, If I were Rhett Butler, I would have. I would have kicked her to the curb, too. See, that made more sense. There was so much fluff in the book that I was like, what is this? So <laughs> so I get it. I pretty much get it. Lord of the Rings. Look, I love Tom Bombadil, but he, he was not needed in the movies. I, I love how, how the Rings of Power Brigade really wanted to bring him up all the time. And it's like, look, his main... His whole job was, you're doing great, kids. Now go that way. <laughs> Why do you need to? Bring... <laughs> that was his job. I mean, gosh. They didn't even know what he did. <laughs> but my point for bringing this up is that Francis Marion. Now we've seen Francis Marion before. She uh, was the writer for The Flapper and Toll of the Sea, Pollyanna, and Son of the Sheik. I think that those are the only movies that we've seen her so far. And she was well known in Hollywood uh, during the silent era. I think she even transitioned into the talkies. But um, this one is a no. I, I'm really disappointed in what she did with this movie. It, I'm. It, I mean, maybe I'm speaking as a fan of Anna Green Gables. That could be it. But see, because the synopsis is here. And of course, we know that uh, Anne Shirley is adopted by Marilla and Matthew uh, Cuthbert who think that they are getting a boy and she works to prove herself to them. Of course, and there's all these mishaps that happen. Of course, there's the whole thing with Gilbert and, and uh, Gilbert Blythe and uh, Anne Shirley so they fall in love as they grow up and uh and Shirley graduates high school and goes to college and you know it, it's this whole thing well the problem is is that we know the story of Anne Shirley in Prince Edward Island we we know this story okay Lucy Maud Montgomery, when she saw this movie, was furious. Absolutely furious. And she tells why. <laughs> Lucy Maud Montgomery, whenever I have read about her, she's a very proud Canadian. Okay, now we all know, I can't stress this enough, we all know that uh, Anne of Green Gables is set and Prince Edward Island. I mean, they've dedicated Prince Edward Island to Anne of Green Gables, from what I understand. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> the story is still popular today. <laughs> Much like Little Women. I mean, it's... Why wouldn't you? Again, like, I've, I've heard that it is, so I've, I've never been there. But um, maybe someday. 
So Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote these books, gave us Anne Shirley and, and her adventures in Prince Edward Island, along with uh, her uh, friend, oh, what was her name? Diana, Diana Barry. <laughs> Couldn't remember her last name for a second. And Gilbert Blythe. Um, she said that her reason for hating the film was because of all these absurdities. Okay, according to what Montgomery said, there was a flag of the United States displayed at Anne's graduation from her Canadian college. This is Prince Edward Island, not Rhode Island. William Desmond Taylor, what are you doing? See, this isn't Frances Marion's fault. No, I really don't believe that she wrote in, make sure there is an American flag there. William Desmond Taylor was the director. Okay. When you're directing, make sure to direct people to get rid of the American flag and put the Canadian flag because the book is set in Canada. <laughs> When I read that, I was like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> wow, that's not a little thing. That's a big thing. There's, uh, there's another scene where, and, and this, okay. This is this is Francis Marion going I don't know if this was supposed to be a funny little scene. So Anne encountered a skunk and mistook it for a kitten. Now I did find a picture of that and I'll put it here. She because I was when I read that, I was like, <laughs> I had to think for a minute. I'm like, no, wait, this didn't happen. Because I was like, when did she meet up with a skunk? Oh, wait, yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> I was starting to question my knowledge of... <laughs> Uh, it says uh, that skunks did not exist on Prince Edward Island at the time the film took place or came out. So I would think that, well, when when does the story take place? Does it say exactly what year? I can't remember. I would think it would be in 1908 because that's when the book was released. So 1908, and then this comes out in 1919. Uh, yeah. There's also a scene where Anne punished a child. Afterward, Anne brandished a shotgun to fend off an angry mob that congregated at her schoolhouse door on the child's behalf. Okay. We know that Anne Shirley is like a tomboy and she's willing to just jump in and deal with an issue, no problem. But uh, punishing a child? I, I don't... I don't believe that. That's not her. That's not the character. So this is another issue I have with Francis Marion. Why are you rewriting the character? That, Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you... 
completely rewrite the character and make her like this gunslinger. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um So those are some of the things that bothered the author. But it goes even further. Um because the film was shot in Massachusetts. Now I don't know if they got clearance to uh, film in Canada. Uh, I don't know. Uh, um, so I, I can't say either way. I, I don't know what it, <laughs> I know I'm saying I don't know a lot, but what I'm trying to say is when it comes to getting uh paperwork and clearance to actually film up in Canada. I don't know what it was like back then. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry for saying I don't know so much. Because <laughs> that gets irritating and I understand. Um, so <laughs> it was uh, Deadham, Massachusetts, but <sighs> I suppose the see this is a this is a problem, and I can understand where uh, where Montgomery would be upset. that it wasn't filmed at the location of Prince Edward Island. Again, I don't know how Hollywood was worked at that time, able to get clearance to, to go to, I don't know how that worked back then. See, because when the Twilight movies were going, this is, <laughs> this was so annoying because it was like, all of a sudden, all of these fans knew everything about Forks because of the books and the movies. Look, I've been to Forks a thousand times. We used to take trips there in the summer. And I had these people who had never heard of Forks before telling me about Forks because somebody decided to write a book about it. And they're like, oh my gosh, the formation is just right. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> she got the formation precise. And it's like, no, she didn't. Because I've been there. <laughs> so I get where Montgomery is coming from. Because filming in Massachusetts, and you're talking about Prince Edward Island, And the structures that you're talking about are not the same. And I mean, and I, I get it. It would be like a Legend of Sleepy Hollow and you, you film it in Texas. It's, yeah, it's. And it's. <laughs> That's not Sleepy Hollow at all. <laughs> Or you could do like they did with Phantom Carriage and just did everything in the studio. I thought that whole thing was on location. Blew my mind. <laughs> do it that way. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, so I, I do. I understand her frustration. Like... It had to be upsetting to, to write this story. 
you're a proud Canadian and you could you couldn't at least try to make it look like the locations and uh <laughs> And at least try. You couldn't travel over to Prince. That's the part that gets me. Why couldn't William Desmond Taylor at least go over there, look at what Prince Edward Island looks like, and then try to dress up Massachusetts? To, if if they weren't able to film over there, like I said, I don't know what. they had to do to get like paperwork and everything going so that the film crew could go over to there. I don't know what it was like in the twenties or in the late, uh, cause the war had just ended. So, uh, they were still in the <laughs> transition of the war was over. Now the twenties and party time, you know, but, Why couldn't he go over there, see what Prince Edward Island was like, and then dress up Massachusetts, wherever it was they were filming, uh, Dedham, dress it up to actually look like the locations were, or even talk to Lucy Maud Montgomery. Did It sounds like they didn't even talk to her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Montgomery was infuriated with the many liberties the film took with her character, including changing Anne from a Canadian to an American. See, this is the problem what's going on now. is that there are all these people that, and I've talked about it in other videos as well, as I especially talked about it with the uh, modernizing Homer, where people are taking these characters and modernizing them, making them fit them, these established characters, and look at this. The author saw it happen before her very eyes, I can't stress it enough. She was a very proud Canadian and to watch the it happened where she was changed to a, a an American. Well, that's not the story. And it may not seem like a big thing, but that's not the story. She wrote the story. She wrote the character, she established the character. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there's there's a in the movie uh Harry and the Hendersons and uh John Lithgow's character is an artist and he He drew this big uh, cutout of a Bigfoot and made him look kind and gentle. And his father, who the actor recently passed away uh, a couple days ago, I saw that. And I don't remember his name. But um, suddenly shows up. with these fangs and claws and everything. And John Lithgow's character says, why did you do that? He means something to me. And it's, it's the same idea. You know, you take a creation and you butcher it and you expect us to just accept it. Somebody worked hard to create this and you're just going to turn around and destroy it. Well, that's what William Desmond Taylor and Francis Marion did. They took liberties, which again, liberties happen in in Hollywood. I understand that. I gave examples, but not to this level. Uh, 
uh, she says that it was that if I think if I hadn't already known it was from my book that I would never have recognized it. The landscape of folks were New England. Uh, never Prince Island. Prince Edward Island, excuse me. Uh, a skunk and an American flag were introduced, both equally unknown in Prince Edward Island. I could have shrieked with rage over the latter. Such crass, blatant Yankeeism. <laughs> and it may seem like little things, like she's overreacting, but what was the point of the skunk? Why do you have Anne Shirley, who is supposed to be an intelligent girl, chasing after a skunk? And I've always thought that Anne Shirley was a very intelligent young lady who just wanted to be loved. There were a lot of things that she knew. She just never got the chance to actually show it. Because she was like this pass around kid that nobody wanted. What's the point of, of mistaking a, a skunk for a kitten? I don't, I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense at all. Like, there's, there's a scene where she and Diana are having the tea party, and unfortunately Diana gets drunk, and that's, it turns out that's the mom's fault, because uh, the mom had put that liquor in the wrong place. Now, at first, she blamed Anne Shirley for getting the girl drunk, getting her daughter drunk. And then it turned out that it all worked out in the end. She realized what she had done. And, and then praised Anne for helping her daughter and because it could have turned out a lot worse. The fact that Anne knew what to do at that moment and realizing what was happening, yeah, it could have turned out a lot worse for Diana. <laughs> it's stuff like that. You know, so I always feel like the, the character of Anne Shirley is so overlooked with the fact that how smart she really is. I mean, yeah, she graduated high school and she becomes a, a school teacher and everything and she gets to do what she wants to do, but there's so much more to her than that. Matthew saw it. And maybe that's why I love Matthew so much. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved Matthew Cuthbert. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> despite the author not liking this movie and being enraged by this movie, that's not what killed it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what else didn't kill it? In fact, the gentleman who played Gilbert Blythe went under controversy. Yeah, Paul Kelly was in jail for a while. I mean, his career, it turns out that his career in the 20s, he was in jail. Uh, but that was in 1927. And I mean, 
So there was that. And uh, that threw me for a loop. So th that was like several years after. The thing that really killed the, I mean, it was almost like this just was not meant to be made at all. So let's get back to William Desmond Taylor and Mary Miles Minter. Now, again, we've talked about these two on my channel. I'll put the video in the description box. I'll put timestamps when I actually talk about that because it's a long video. And I was actually talking about when a silent film was supposed to be filmed here and it never happened. Still wondering what happened with that silent film. <laughs> it disappeared. <laughs> yeah. So William Desmond Taylor was a director. And all of a sudden in 1922 or 1923, let me check here. 1922. I was right the first time. <laughs> oh, too much stuff up here. Anyway, so in 1922, he was murdered. Okay. And this is when things got really weird. Okay, it started to come out that he had family... Over on the East Coast. He had been married before. <laughs> it was like the weirdest thing ever. It's all in the, the video that I did before. So I'm not going to dwell on that because it's, it's on the other video. Here's the thing. Is that with this movie, this Anna Green Gables, this was the first movie, as I said before, that he and Mary worked on. And this is said to be where she fell in love with him now he's 30 years older than her all right and everybody around him made it clear that he never reciprocated her affections for him and everything and she was pretty much throwing herself at him and the thing about mary Miles Minter is that she had a stage mom times a thousand. <laughs> I don't like her mom. I can't say anything nice about her mom. Uh, to give you an idea, she lied about Mary's age because there was an age limit to when kids could work in Hollywood even back then and well people lied about their kids age even back then yeah and but mary's mom used the birth certificate of a dead child like she just did not care <laughs> she just didn't and um, I feel I, to this day, I feel bad for Mary, Mary Mentor. I truly believe that her mom brainwashed her into believing that she and uh, William Desmond Taylor were soulmates. Look, everywhere I have looked, because I have continued to look in on the case of William Desmond Taylor, and as far as I know, it's still officially open. I mean, there have been a lot of people who have looked at the case and have pretty much figured out who did it. It was the mom. <laughs> I cracked it down in that video, and you can see what I mean. And there was somebody in the 80s that looked at the case because uh, I think it was after... Uh, Mary Minter died. She died in 84, and I think he looked at it in 86. Said the same thing. Pretty much came to the same conclusion I did. And, um, and there have been others who have looked at it and 
pretty much everybody you look at has come to the same conclusion. It was the mom. But, you know, it's it's a lot like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Everybody knows what happened, but it has to pretty much stay an open case because, you know, <laughs> officially and until otherwise noted. Uh, as far as I know, that one is still open as well. Unless, I mean, <laughs> I haven't looked in it for a long time. Anyway. So poor Mary, I mean, she believed to the day she died that she and William Desmond Taylor were soulmates. Now, when he died, when he was killed, the problem is that she was telling journalists that she loved him, that they were secretly having an affair and all of this, and... She just, she couldn't keep her trap shut, basically. It, in his house, there were love letters. He, here's what I have to say about that. And uh, I don't remember if I said it in the video, but I'm going to say it here. When it comes to the love letters, he may have received them, never looked at them. Because I don't remember if they were open or closed. But even at that. It could be one of those things where he opens them, then tosses them aside, may have thought that they ended up in the garbage bin. I do this all the time. I'll throw, you know, toss towards the garbage bin, think that they ended up there. And a month later, it's like, oh. <laughs> it's still here in my room. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> You know, because it ends up behind something, you know, and especially if your garbage bin is right next to like an end table or something. Yeah, it probably has stuff behind the end table. We don't know. But of course, the media has to run wild with it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this old man is taking advantage of this young child. And it's like everybody and i mean everybody around him was saying that he never received there were times where she would come to his to his property and want to see him and he refused to see her basically telling her leave the only time that he would interact with her was on set he kept it professional the entire time and <laughs> So, basically, because again, I don't want to dwell on that. Everything is in that video. I will have it in the description box for you. What shut down and intentionally had this film destroyed was the scandal of William Desmond Taylor and Mary Minter, which, as far as I'm concerned, only existed in her head poor thing you know <laughs> it was a case of a mother who didn't want to work and used her child and um again i'll have that all that information in the description box for you i have nothing nice to say about that mom i feel really bad for mary i have seen people say that she was conniving and took advantage i really don't think so i think she, she was very naive and you know one of those people pleaser type of people and uh just i do i feel bad there's no way that you continue to say that someone is your soulmate for all those years i mean he died in 1922 and in in the 80s she was still saying that he was a soulmate. That's so, yeah, I truly believe that her mom was brainwashing her into believing. So I think that her mom truly believed that William Desmond Taylor was going to shoot her into stardom like Clara Bow or Louise Brooks or something like that. And when that didn't happen, when it wasn't happening fast enough, she snapped. <laughs> <laughs> And the media ran wild when, and it just, it brought this 
it ended this movie. It ended her career as well. She, her career ended in 1923. She, she was actually moving up. She was moving up to stardom. She, many thought that she was going to take over uh, roles that Mary Pickford did. She had the look, uh, she, you know, the, the cute sausage curls and everything and all that. Because Mary Pickford was actually moving on to more um, adult and, uh, roles because she wanted to grow up. You know, she didn't want to do the, the little kid stuff anymore. And she did. She wanted to grow up. And so Mary Minter was going to take over that, you know, but this all screwed it up and it destroyed this movie. So there was an end of Green Gable silent film in 1919. Uh, the author of the book, Lucy Maud Montgomery, hated it. I don't blame her. I really don't blame her. I, uh, William Desmond Taylor, may he rest in peace. Uh, he he should have caught a lot of that. And Frances Marion, I have all respect for her. She was a great writer. Uh, the Flapper is one of my favorites. I mean, <laughs> I absolutely love The Flapper. That was, to this day, that's one of my favorites. But the skunk thing doesn't make any sense. And and to have Anne, well, I guess we don't know how Anne punished the child. I guess I'm I'm, uh, but it must be really bad if there was an angry mob. Yeah, it, I mean, I don't know. Again, I I'm all fine with liberties. I mean, Gone with the Wind movie is better than the book, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Tom Bombadil didn't need to be in the movie. Pretty much all his job is, is you're doing great, kids. Go that way. <laughs> as a fan of Tom Bombadil, you know, it's, it, it's just an addition that doesn't need to be there. But... The things that I'm reading about this, Lucy Maud Montgomery has every right to be upset. She really does. Proud Canadian, and you're putting an American flag in there. And I'm sorry, but it sounds like William Desmond Taylor didn't even talk to her. That doesn't mean he didn't. But even then, why didn't he go to Prince Edward Island? I said it earlier. Why didn't he go to Prince Edward Island, look to see where it was, and then dress up Massachusetts, you know, where he was? Or was it uh, Deadham, Massachusetts, to to look like it? There have been others, you know, like I said, with Sleepy Hollow. I'm sure that if somewhere in the UK, if they were to do a film in the UK and they wanted to do Sleepy Hollow, okay, I'm sure that they would do their research to make it look like Sleepy Hollow. Even in the silent era. Come on. <laughs> or like I said, do like the Phantom Carriage where it was all on set. I thought it was on location. So, <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so anyway, in closing, now that I've rambled on, <laughs> there was an Anne of Green Gables silent film. It's gone. Um, it says as of 1999, uh, every copy is gone, but we've said that before, haven't we? <laughs> so another case of look through your attics, see what you can find. Um, I'll have those videos in, in the description box for you. I will make sure to have the, the time stamps for the William Desmond Taylor bit that I talk about, because, yeah, that one video is long. And um, this film just wasn't meant to be, I think. <laughs> or at least just talk. I, I already said everything, but I just, 
I don't know. I mean, I've seen other things that William Desmond Taylor has done, and they're good. Again, Frances Marion, our respect to her, Flapper is my favorite. I mean, <laughs> and and Toll of the Sea. I do love Toll of the Sea. Yes. So uh, th this just doesn't make any sense, what she's, the liberties that she's putting in this. And I fully understand liberties. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Big disappointment here. <laughs> and uh, so it was the uh, scandal between Mary Minter and Desmond Taylor after he died that killed, that they decided, to, that Hollywood decided to destroy all the copies. It wasn't because uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery was enraged. <laughs> That's what I thought was going to bring it down. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I've seen where other authors are upset about, the, what was that one? The Blizzard? The I think that was in Sweden. And yeah, there was that silent film. Uh, and, and, and they took all kinds of liberties. They can, yeah, and she was not happy. That author was not happy at all. So I, I don't know. I guess I just kind of assumed. But yeah, it's it's that scandal that brought it down after William Desmond Taylor died. So, but anyway, I'll close up here.